greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. John 15, 13. I thought of these words recently in the death of the former fire chief of Buffalo Township, Pennsylvania, Corey Comparatore. Some of you saw this, of course, now a, a story that has gone global, really, uh, at a Trump rally uh, on the date of July 13th, 2024, a fateful Saturday. This uh, former fireman was attending the rally that President Trump was speaking at and got caught in the crossfire of an assassin's attack on the president. And Corey Comparatore, according to numerous reports and the testimony of his very own daughter, Allison, as bullets came in, had an instinctive reaction, uh, basically threw his wife and daughter to the ground in an act of great love and shielded them from the assassin's bullets. And it appears, it's hard to know exactly what happened, that he may very well have saved their lives because one of those bullets hit Comparatore in that action. Corey Comparatore uh, was reputedly a Christian, uh, was a, a strong citizen of his community, and um, left a, a legacy, really, for us to consider. I, I have tried on the course of this podcast to highlight stories like this of courage and heroism, and I want to do so on this episode of Grace and Truth, because we want to remember for all the bad stories out there that you can find of people acting terribly, of men using their strength against people, against women and children, for example, this is one of those wonderfully encouraging stories that shows us what manhood can be and is to be by the grace of God. Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I'm going to be your host. Please, as usual, subscribe to this podcast on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple. That is a huge help to us. And also, if you can, review the podcast. That is also an enormous strength uh, benefit uh, to the podcast. Thanks for joining me in this summer series. I'm again recording uh, from a different location and so thankful to have you back with me in this summer series. At the funeral um, for Corey Comparatory just a few days ago, uh, many, many people gathered to honor him. Uh, the country singer Billy Ray Cyrus uh, flew in and sang at the funeral. Again, even the funeral itself was a, a cause for national news coverage, and rightly so. In fact, President Trump memorialized Comparatore at his uh, speech at the Republican National Convention just a few days ago. Trump said this about Corey Comparatore. He lost his life selflessly acting as a human shield to protect them, his wife and daughter, from flying bullets. What a fine man he was. Uh, and then Trump went on to say this. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for others. Echoing that verse that I read just a minute ago, John 15, 13. As I've said, Comparatory had quite a record of service to his community and his country. He served 10 years in the U.S. Army Reserves. He was chief of the Buffalo uh, Volunteer Fire Department in the early 2000s in Pennsylvania. He was a churchgoer. He was a loving father and husband. I want to give you four uh, brief reflections today uh, on the life and example of Corey Comparatory, because as I say, we need to stop and pause in these moments, even if, of course, tons of us never met him, did not know him. But these are moments when we can stop just for a few minutes and think about his life and think about our own lives. And I want to say this to all people, men and women, uh, boys and girls alike, but I want to say it as well with a special focus on men. And I have this focus on men, not because men are important and women are unimportant, but because men really are called to do what Comparatore did. This is such a beautiful example of a vision of Christ-like manhood. And as I stated a few minutes ago, there are so many examples of unchristlike manhood out there. Just a few days ago, in catching up on email, uh, a news story popped up that I wasn't looking for, but it was of a man who uh, tragically killed uh, his wife and his four children in the South. Just this horrific example of violence, a man. I don't know the whole story, but for some satanic reason, taking a gun, killing his wife to her shock, and then killing his four 
precious children. And it's, it's those moments that honestly, you don't know who this person is. Of course, you're not plunged into the situation yourself, but it takes the wind out of you. And, and for a few brief moments, even if you don't know the family involved, you, you question, you know, the meaning of everything, not, not, not that God exists or something or the goodness of God, but just you question how evil can predominate in this world and, and how people can do such wicked, horrible things. And you know, of course, that the seeds of such evil is not just out there and those people, the seeds of such evil is in all our heart, all our mind. Uh, but for the grace of God, we could be a news headline in some terrible way. So again, there's all sorts of terrible things that you can find out there in media coverage and their real happenings. Then there are encouraging moments when, even as horrific evil on the part of this would-be assassin of President Trump occurs, even as he comes within a few millimeters of killing President Trump, a wicked, wicked act, he also uh, sends bullets in the direction of innocent uh, bystanders and uh, so, so terrible evil. And this man loses his life. But in the context of that terrible evil, there's amazing heroism. And so that's my first reflection for you today on this episode of Grace and Truth. Corey Comparatore is a hero. Economists warn that massive tax hikes could devastate your IRA and 401k account as the stock market braces for impact. With inflation on the rise and global uncertainty looming, it's clear why central banks and savvy Americans are turning to gold. If you haven't had your eye on gold, time to make it a priority. Hi, my name is Owen Strand, and I urge you to call my friends at Priority Gold to find out how they can help you diversify your savings with physical gold and silver. Call 1-800-405-GOLD or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden for a free gold info guide. Plus, see if you qualify for free shipping and storage. Experts agree that physical gold is one of the best ways to fortify your savings, no matter the economic climate. Act now to get your portfolio working for you while the market is golden. Call 1-800-405-GOLD to speak with a gold specialist or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden to learn more. That's 1-800-405-GOLD. He's a hero who gave his life uh, in order to protect his wife and daughter. He gives us then a common grace picture of what Jesus did in dying on the cross for his people. Jesus died on the cross to protect and ransom and rescue us. Jesus died on the cross about 2,000 years ago so that you and I would not taste the Father's just wrath against our sin, but would know only the total forgiveness and everlasting covenant love of God the Father. Corey Comparatore didn't, didn't die for anyone's sins, didn't wash anyone clean, didn't take the father's wrath when he took the assassin's bullet in Butler, Pennsylvania. But he does give us a little picture of the death of Jesus for others. He shows us, that is, what it means to be selfless and self-sacrificial in order that his wife, literally his wife, uh, would live and his daughter, his precious Allison, would live as well. So I know the postmodernists have tried to take uh, the categories of um, evildoer and hero from us. I know one movie after another, for example, has complicated those categories and shown us that there really aren't heroes out there, that everyone's you know, equally an evildoer. And we want to be clear, of course, that Jesus is the only true hero, but we also can't lose the reality that there is goodness in the world and wickedness in the world. And there are those who act heroically in the world and those who act evilly in the world. And Thomas Crooks, the would-be assassin of President Trump, who killed, it appears, Corey Comparatore, is an evildoer. Even as we know that Thomas Crooks has met his maker already, and there is no opportunity for him to repent of his sins, we know that justice is right, but we pray that others will, from this tragic event, know the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Corey Comparatore died so that his wife and his daughter could live in this uh, natural sense, this temporal sense. And again, for that, he's a hero.
So I would encourage you as a father or mother alike, I would encourage you to talk to your kids about this. Don't just note this story or listen to this humble little podcast or, or anyone else who's talking about this rightly so, but pass this on and, and, and build this kind of teaching into your home and into your discipleship of your kids. Again, boy and girl, young man, young woman alike. And give them the category of heroism in this world. Not that, of course, we're going to be a hero and save ourselves salvifically, spiritually, or something like that. No, but help them understand there really is goodness and there really is evil. And even outside of this story, there are people who are not believers who act heroically and there are people who act evilly. So we, we want our kids to have these categories and tragic events like this. Uh, give us a context for discussing these kind of situations and principles. Second uh, reflection to offer you in this episode, the Bible has a category for this kind of sacrifice, even in the temporal sense, just the natural sense. Think of what Romans 5, 6 to 8 uh, teaches us. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The point is this. The Apostle Paul discusses laying down your life for others and has a category for, in verse 7, Romans 5, 7, a good person daring even to die. So, so again, in a common grace sense, outside of the Christian church, that is, people do act selflessly and heroically for others. And the Bible itself, the Apostle Paul himself, understands that this happens in the world, but, but there is no spiritual uh, redemption that occurs, of course, when someone dies for another, even as that act is a, a good act. Uh, only the death of Jesus Christ can redeem sinners like you and me, which, which again, focuses our attention uh, not ultimately on Corey Comparatori or someone who acts uh, heroically as he did, but points us to the much, much greater sacrifice of King Jesus who left glory, who left heaven, who left communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit and came to this earth, communion in the heavenly sense, it endured on earth and then lived a perfectly righteous life and then died in the ultimate act, the, the atoning act of passive righteousness on the cross for sinners. So even as we're thinking about comparatory sacrifice, our eyes really should go up towards Christ's sacrifice and understand just how great then the love of God is for sinners like us, that Jesus stepped in for us. Jesus died in our place. Jesus took the just wrath of the Father. These are wonderful moments then, horrific as they are, where we can point people to the reality of redemption and say, you're innately, instinctively moved by this fireman's sacrifice for his wife and his daughter. It's totally right that you would be deeply moved, cut to your core by this true story of Corey Comparatory's death for others. Let me tell you, though, about a much greater act of self-sacrifice that Jesus Christ uh, did in order that sinners like you and me would live. And that is a wonderful way both to honor a fallen man like Comparatory, but ultimately to point things upward to the sacrifice of Christ, the saving sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice, the propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus. Third reflection on this tragic event. It reminds us that heroes are not altogether gone in this era. It can sometimes feel to you and me like there are no heroes left, like there are no uh, good men, like there is no uh, light in our world that endures. But what I want you to hear in this, uh, on this occasion is that that is not true. So we should be realists as Christians. We should know that the days are evil. We should know that men are struggling. I wrote a whole book on that called The War on Men, which is not just about the struggles of men, but is actually more about how men can find hope and transformation and healing and growth 
in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm honest in, in my writing and in this podcast, I'm honest in The War on Men, this book I recently published about how men aren't doing well. And so we've got to be clear. We've got to be honest. There are a lot of men who aren't stepping up. There are a lot of men who aren't uh, leading their family. There are a lot of men who aren't, by the grace of God, pressing in to know Christ and, and build a godly life. Um, there are a lot of young men who are struggling tremendously to, to mature and grow up and, and not devote themselves to childish things. We have an epidemic of, of this uh, today. We have a generation of young men, not every young man, of course, but a lot of young men who are just adrift and struggling and, and don't know what to do and, and don't even know how to get started in life. And what we want to say is, is not that we hate those young men. Not, we don't, we don't want to cancel those young men. Um, we, we don't want to teach those young men that they have messed things up and there's no way back for them. We want to help young men understand that there is a way back. We want to help them know that yes, they may have serious patterns of sin and failure and darkness and discouragement in their life, but those can all be overcome by the gospel. And I even want to say this, I want to turn this from the abstract to the personal. If this is you, if you as a man um, are, are in uh, difficult circumstances, if you're discouraged, if you're battling uh, the, the realities of life and you feel uh, defeated a good number of days in your daily existence on this earth, maybe you are a believer even, let's say you're a Christian, but you're just struggling uh, to, to get you know, through one day after another. I want you to hear this. I, I'm not coming to you and condemning you. I'm not coming to you and saying, you know, you're done. You're used up. You missed your train. Uh, you can't change. You can't grow. You can't live a victorious life in the spirit on a regular basis. I'm coming to you and I'm saying the opposite. I'm coming to you and I'm saying, look at this example of this man, a man just like us, a sinner, uh, saved by grace from different reports, compare Torre, and, and be inspired by it. Don't be condemned by it. That would be the wrong way to hear this episode. And that would be the wrong way to engage this heroic action, to look at it and go, well, that's not me. And then conclude even furthermore, that could never be me. At the very heart of our democracy lies a principle we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives. This leaves many feeling voiceless in conversations that are crucial to our financial independence and security. This is where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth Protection Research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. These are the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Wealth Protection Report. This free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch and listeners can get it completely free. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech, as I, Owen Strand, absolutely do, and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 election protection report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment does not think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. Again, text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free lead, copy. Uh, Support, a kind of uh, free godly speech. life. I can't lead a productive life even. I can't make advancements in maturity. I, I've messed up. I've made these mistakes. I've committed these sins and I can't move forward. Let's say you're a man who has gotten married, who does have kids, who has a, a marriage. Let's say uh, you're, you're a Christian man, but you yourself see that you know, you're know you not where you should be. Let's say there are patterns of sin in your own life. Again, I don't come to you and say, look at Corey Comparatore. He, he's a man and you're not. No, we're, that's not what we're saying. Events like this offer us a fresh opportunity, I would say, uh, not to be condemned, 
uh, not to be depressed by other men's heroism, but something much greater can happen, to be inspired and to say, the locusts in my life may have eaten some years. They may have gotten into the barn and they may have eaten up some of the good that I could have put there. But I'm not going to let myself live in satanic discouragement and accusation. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go deep with God. I'm going to ask God to do a great work in me so that I can change, I can grow, I can mature, I can find victory, at least increasing measures of victory in my journey of sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Men, women alike, this is what the gospel does in us. The gospel doesn't come to us and ultimately condemn us. The gospel comes to us and lifts our head and says to us, Let's go, let's grow, let's rise, let's build. And men today in particular, I think, are very much discouraged and disheartened and depressed by their circumstances, by their sin patterns, and by their past. And what we want to do is take a moment like this, be genuinely inspired by this man's life and even by his death, and be reminded that we ourselves, by the grace of God working in us, can change and grow and lead a life that honors and glorifies God. And that is not because we simply listen to some guru and we get some better habits and some better patterns and we lead kind of a more Spartan existence that is more disciplined than it used to be. No, this is all driven by, again, the grace and mercy that is found in Jesus Christ, uh, the gospel that lifts our head, and the Holy Spirit who powers us on to become something greater to tomorrow than we were today. All of this leads to my fourth and final reflection. This is what we need men to be. This is what we need men to be. Men who are motivated by love and self-sacrificial. We need men to be men who are motivated by love and thus live in a self-sacrificial way. And that again points us not to any man, however heroic, uh, who is a sinner like us. That points us again to the image of Jesus Christ, Jesus who laid down his life, Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, for his bride, who literally died for sinners. And that's the kind of man we want to be shaped to be. And that, again, puts us back in discussions we've engaged already on this podcast, discussions of what male leadership looks like and what headship looks like in the home and in the church. And there is an attempted recovery on the part of many young men today where they say, I've been raised in an egalitarian context or a feminist influence feminist influence context in the home or in the church. I don't want that. I want to be a, a, a leader as a man. I want to be a strong man according to scripture. And that can be a very good desire. But if you are not calibrated by the scripture, if you're calibrated by red pill manhood or podcast manhood or secular manhood, even secular strong manhood, then you can end up off the rails. In fact, you can be raised in one ditch and you can leap right into the other and you can end up thinking that your job as a strong man is to dominate women or rule women or something like this when that is not your God-given calling. Whatever leadership you are called to exercise as a man in the context of marriage and the church and, and whatever that looks like in society, your leadership is to look like self-sacrificial, Christ-like headship. So, for example, as the head of a woman, the head of a wife, yes, you have genuine leadership and genuine authority even, but take note, that is always conditioned by the image of Jesus Christ. You're always seeking then to live a life of loving leadership. This is not cold leadership. This is not cold headship. This is not cold eldership in the local church. This is always warm leadership, very warm leadership. 
the kind of leadership that seeks the good of women, the kind of leadership that seeks the good of children. Again, as we see in this example of Corey Comparatore shielding his wife and his daughter from an assassin's bullet. But here's the thing. You don't just do that one day. That doesn't just pop up one day. That, at least in many cases, is the result of a long trajectory in that direction. In other words, we want to raise our boys to be Christ-like men, to be self-sacrificial men over the long haul. We don't just, you know, have boys, give them no basic instruction in these kind of realities, not talk to them about what Christian leadership looks like, and then when they're 19 or 20 or 21, expect them to suddenly arise as heroes in difficult moments. You, you don't form heroes out of thin air. Now, God is the one who forms them, of course, ultimately, but we train young men into these kind of roles. We help young men understand, yes, you're called by God to be strong, genuinely in biblical terms, but a strong man is a man who lives in love and acts in strength out of love. He doesn't act in strength out of some kind of desire to dominate or simply to rule. Whatever leadership he exercises flows out of the love of God into his life. And then his life is a life uh, bathed in love and his leadership and, and whatever authority he is given by God to steward uh, proceeds itself out of love. That is an altogether different understanding then of authority than secular authority that simply says, reject feminism and men, you know, be red blooded and be tough and don't accept any, you know, kickback and just find your manhood again and, and take the red pill. And, uh, man, uh, wherever you find feminism, snuff it out and, and just fire back at it and be a hard man. There's some resonance of the biblical worldview uh, with some of that. But fundamentally, you can't get Christian manhood from non-Christian sources. You're only going to get Christian manhood from the Bible. Biblical manhood, Christian manhood, is a glorious blend of 100% toughness and 100% tenderness, 100% truth and 100% grace. So as I've said on previous episodes, and I'm sure I'll say on more episodes to come because these themes are so important and so misunderstood and often not balanced today, not just in terms of what we teach, but in how we live, we've got to state these things afresh. And we've got to make clear that we do have to call our sons to be ready to lead in multiple contexts, uh, family, church, society, as God works in their life and, and sets that up in their life. It's up to God, not us, of course. But we also recognize that that leadership is distinctly biblical, gospel-shaped leadership. That is leadership that is to look like and be flavored by and powered by the example and grace of Jesus Christ. And that's what the world needs. That's what people are looking for. When you find a man who will step up as this heroic fireman did in a form to a degree, that's what people are looking for. People are looking for men who will lay their life down for others to the degree that the Apostle Paul recognizes, even in a common grace sense, that's a good thing in Romans 5. But ultimately, it's not enough just to have uh, soldiers who will go to war and, and defend a nation or something like this, or policemen who will be in a community and, and, and protect it and keep it safe. It, that's not enough. You've got to have more. You've got to have infinitely more. Ultimately, you have to have a Savior who will come and die in our place for us so that we can live eternally and, and, and be holy before God, counted holy through justifying faith, and then made progressively holy by the indwelling work of the Spirit, progressive sanctification unfolding for every believer, man and woman alike. But then we ultimately are made for a relationship, not just where we are 
holy and we confirm that to God and God sees that in us, that holiness is glorious and it, it gives God great honor, but actually we're made for loving relationship with God. We're made by God out of love so that God can love us. And then we are made so that we can love God. Our Christian life is not cold or static. Then our Christian life is warm and dynamic in that biblical sense. That's what we're made for. So the kind of men who are most going to love others are men who know the love of God and have been transformed by the love of God. And that love of God God has woken them up in every category of their life so that now they want to live in love. But love doesn't mean being squishy and unconvictional and never taking a stand and never stepping up. Biblical love on this earth at its apex means men being strong for others when applied to men. It looks like men laying down their life for others. Greater love has no one than this, a man laying down his life for his friends. That's how Jesus phrases it in John 15, 13. You can't find greater love than someone laying down his life for his friends. And that doesn't point us to you and me, man or woman alike, because women, of course, can do this as well. That points us at the peak to Jesus Christ. So every day in conclusion for the Christian is a day when we celebrate the ultimate hero. We celebrate the true savior, Jesus Christ. Every single day is a day purchased for us by the death of Christ on our behalf. Every day is a fresh opportunity by the power of God in us to live for the glory of God. Every single day then to the unbeliever, hopefully unbelievers hearing my voice on this humble podcast is a day for that unbeliever, not just to aspire to slightly better living, slightly more courage or something like this, but every day is a fresh opportunity that God gives unbelievers to repent of their sin and know the transforming grace and love that he gives sinners through Jesus Christ. So every day is a fresh day. Let us number our days. The days of Corey Comparatory on this earth are sadly ended. They're over. That will be true for all of us. Here is the question I leave you with. How are we going to live out these days? What are we going to do with the hours God would give us, man or woman alike? How, by the Spirit's power, can we sow and reap for God? How can we give God glory? How can we grow? How can we mature by the grace of God to the glory of God? And a final word for men. Whatever your present and your past looks like, how can the grace and mercy of God get hold of you, Christian or unchristian alike, and change you and grow you and transform you so that you either become a Christian or you grow as a Christian and give God great glory? Every day is a day you and I can live with this on our mind. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus has done that however we can out of the overflow of what Jesus has done. Let us do that. God bless you.